The first item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, the first item on the agenda is adjustments uh, to the agenda. Connie. I would just like to note that um, item under superintendent's report uh, on the high school student service project. Uh, Mr. Crosby, the teacher who is in charge of that, does intend to be here, but he had a prior commitment. So he thinks he'll be here about 8.30. So I just want to defer that item until he is able to get here. Thank you. Charlie? Um, the technology committee has not met since our last meeting, so there will be no report. Thank you. Yeah. Keith? Uh, the same thing for the uh, art curriculum report. The meeting is actually tomorrow. Okay. Are there any adjustments? After the um, regular board meeting adjustment items, we will take a recess to do a budget workshop, come back into session to then go into executive um, session afterwards. But um, that's sort of the way the flow of the meeting will go. Um, approval of February 13th school board minutes. We got a new copy, Carla? I actually have one correction to the minutes. On um, page 22B, item 7F, art curriculum report, um, minor correction. I gave the um, report on the meeting for January 22nd, and Keith gave the report for the meeting on February 12th. Thank you. Is there any other adjustments? Seeing none, the, board, the minutes for the February 13th meeting are approved. Um, and I just wanted to um, inform the public or tell the public that they are welcome to speak on any agenda item um, at least one time for a maximum of five minutes. And to be recognized, please just raise your hand. Um, the next item is comments by high school and middle school reps. Do we have high school reps? Hi. Um, today we had a blood drive in our gym and just about estimating there was probably about 50 students that donated blood and it seemed to go very well from what I saw of it. And the one acts were at Bonnie Eagle and they placed as the ultimates which is third place and that was their state. And the performances will be next week for Jack and the Submission because they got postponed because of the snow. Um, Friday there will be a semi-formal hosted by the freshmen and sophomores and there will be a live school band. And last Saturday, the debate team had their states at Bates College, and Rachel Ephron was the state champion in Lincoln Douglas. Great. Are there any questions? Would, would you announce again the date and the time of the one act? The one act was at Bonnie Eagle. And they're not doing it again for the public? Next week. Is that Jack in the submission? The performance is next week. Probably Tuesday. Is it Tuesday and Thursday again at 7? Probably. All right. You're not sure exactly? Okay. No. That's fine. That's, <laughs> that's what it was the week before when it got okay. snowed. It was Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7 or 7.30. Okay. So. Thank you. <laughs> Is there a middle school rep? Yeah. Mine's a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's start with the lower grades and work our way up. The fifth and sixth grade challenge language arts will go to Augusta to see playwrights on April 4th. Mr. Jones' sixth grade class is going to Reiki School to teach other students how to weave art stuff. All right, okay, now on to the seventh grade. The annual seventh grade huge science projects are being presented for the classes this week. The Triple C Science Fair will be on March 29th, and that's when you can go see all of the projects that they did. Also in seventh grade, Katie Dana won the spelling bee, and the county bee will be on March 21st, and she'll be in that. There are two new seventh graders who have recently joined us, one Jared Silver, and the other's name is Jen Martin. 
Okay, now we can move on to the most exciting news, the eighth grade happenings. Some of them actually have to do with seventh grade too, so I'll tell you about these first. Seventh and eighth grade girls basketball is almost over. Their last home game will be tomorrow. Boys basketball is long since over with. And baseball and softball signups for the seventh and eighth grade have started, and I'm sure the lacrosse signups will be soon. There will be the indoor track championships on March 30th. The ice hockey team made the playoffs, um, but unfortunately they lost their first game. But they nonetheless had an extremely good season over overall. Also, the math team did very well in their last meet. They won. But I'm really sorry because I completely forgot to get a record of the um, results <laughs> and like what happened for Mr. Wilbur today. But I'm sure Alicia will report on them next time. She'll bring some stuff. But I'm pretty proud to say that the student council has donated money to purchase shirts for the fifth and sixth grade math team so they can be pretty official with their uniforms. Okay, now here's what you really want to hear. <laughs> Exclusively eighth grade stuff. You know you want to hear it. Okay, well, the top 28 students in French and Spanish recently took the French, national French and national Spanish exams, but we obviously don't have the results yet. I personally thought the tests were very easy. The eighth grade band is going to perform in Augusta on March 29th at the State House for a main day celebration. That should be really fun. Also, that week is the week we do the main unit when we go to Augusta and visit the State House and the State Museum. Mr. Moore will be taking some students to Washington, D.C. in May, but that is, isn't going to be happening through the school, which is something he does aside. Okay, I'm almost done. The whole school will be participating in a magazine drive that we've done in past years for a fundraiser. A lot of this money will go towards Chewanke for this year's sixth graders and next year's sixth graders. This will be happening in the near future, but not too soon because we don't have anything. Well, actually, we don't have very, well, we have some, some information. We don't have very much, though. Uh, lastly, the talent show is coming up at the end of March, and this will be on the 28th, and my friend and I will be emceeing it, so it should be really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> we hope that everybody can come see us. And also, on the side, um, the, there was a Triple C music festival in the beginning of March that a lot of people, or a lot of students, went to. It was just for students who tried and made out and made the um, cuts before, I think it was before Christmas or quite soon afterwards. So it was pretty fun. That's it. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions? I have an addition to the high school after this young lady. Are there any questions on the middle school? Yep, thank you. thank you. Just to, to ask the two young ladies, is the Fine Arts Night for the high school still scheduled for the 26th of March? That will be the art display and, and the music program, correct? And then, um, Mr. DeFusco, have, do you know if the Parent Forum is still having the program with the college reps coming on the, Wednesday night, the, 20, the 27th? Thank you. Two important evenings at the high school. Great. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is communications. Connie, do you have any? Yes, and I have a communication here from the from Debbie Lane, our town clerk, on nomination papers. Um, it does seem to be that time of year again, and I simply will read her notice. She wanted us to be sure through this medium to let the community know. I'd like to thank you for, um, actually she starts out by thanking us uh, for agreeing to announce the following. Nomination papers for school board and town council are now available at the town clerk's office. Submission deadline is Monday, March 25th at 5 p.m. Two seats are available for school board and town council. That's two seats each. Please note, as of today, one set of papers for school board have been taken out. Interested citizens may contact Debbie Lane Town Clerk at 799-7665. Um, I think the school board would certainly be concerned if there were limited applications or what have you. I, is there something we should say in addition to just letting people know that the time is running out? It's a lot of fun to be on the school board, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you get an insight into a lot of things, uh, what it's like to run the school Of course board. it is. I'm in my third term. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I certainly want to say, as somebody who's been a superintendent for 13 years in two different towns, um, I probably never did appreciate fully as a teacher uh, what school board members do. It is a very real citizen activity. It is a sign of being willing to put in sometimes very thankless long hours, I will admit that. But we appreciate, the school people appreciate the work that goes on, and as a superintendent, I can assure you, it's a very meaningful job. So I do hope there are people out there that are interested. If you want any more information, feel free to call me and I'll tell you all the funsy things about it. <laughs> um, are there any other communications? I do have one that uh, we've just received. Um, and this is from the high school. We do have a little flyer for, I don't know if do we have any other. This was just sent to the school board this morning. Okay. Um, this is a, a notice of a young writers conference, which is sponsored by the Cape Elizabeth High School Parents Forum and the Cape Elizabeth High School English Department and Bartleby, the literary journal of Cape Elizabeth High School students. It will be held this Saturday, March 16th from 1 to 8.30 p.m. at the, uh, actually at the middle school. Cape Elizabeth Middle School, and we do have a schedule here. There are workshops and presenters um, from, and the items that will be covered, among other things, will be uh, writing a novel, journal writing, poetry, um, autobiography, and the personal narrative. Um, and in fact, it will also include uh, a supper in the cafetorium. So I hope that, um, uh, I'm assuming that most of the people attending will be students. Mm -hmm. But I think if they obviously uh, will be, if there are any interested parents, we would want to invite them too. And just to add that the keynote speaker is Candace Stover, who won the um, 1994 Maine Chapbook Award. She wrote Holding Patterns. Um, and I, I think it proves to be very exciting. And Ms. Franklin mentioned that at 7 o'clock, the students will be doing their own readings for the public. Excellent. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is Superin. Oh, Chief, sorry. Uh, just an announcement that the uh, School Service Delivery Study Committee has been uh, selected. I, I sat with the, uh, the, the appointment committee uh, with counselors McLaughlin, Reed, and Linnell. Uh, we had eight applicants for a, a seven position committee, and uh, they'll be announcing the members of that committee tomorrow at the, the counselor meeting. Uh, the committee is charged with reviewing all the services necessary to support our uh, educational mission, including facilities management, transportation, food service, purchasing, and uh, accounting methods and so forth. And uh, their charge is to come back and report to us. Uh, I guess it's probably going to be in our September school board meeting and then prepare a final report for the town council uh, for the December council meeting. Thank you, Keith. Are there any other communications? I have um, one other. I was going to do it with a technology meeting, but since we haven't had a meeting, I'll do it now. I have received um, information uh, from the State Department on a regional meeting set up to try to give us some more technical information on the PUC 9X order. The uh, meeting for this area will be April 9th. Uh, in Portland at the Ramada Inn. It is free. Um, I have also talked to Jay Schirmer, our town librarian, because we are trying to attend these meetings as a sort of a community team with the town as well as the school involved. And naturally, we will be sending people from our system. Actually, the last meeting was attended by Jay. Joyce Bell, our high school librarian, and myself. And I think this time will include a few other people. Uh, I have the information. Uh, which just came in the other day. So anybody who is interested in going, let me know, and we'll make the reservations. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is superintendent's report. Honey. Thank you. I'm going to start with the summary on the 11th grade MEAs. The board has already in workshop session had a chance to talk with uh, Sharon Merrill, our guidance director, about not only the MEAs, but also some of the other high school level tests we give. And uh, this one was recently focused uh, in the paper, or featured in, the, in an article in the paper, I think, basically uh, talking about Gorham students. So we, you have a copy in your packet of the 
results of that eight, uh, 11th grade MEA taken at the very end of school last year, and you have had some preliminary information on it, but uh, you had asked to have a more detailed summary, and Mrs. Merrill's here to do that. Great. Uh, yes, I know that you all have the MEA report, and we also included a 10-year history of our scores in the form of a chart. And I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have from the report. Um, but I wanted to make a few comments about the 95 scores because, um, as you can tell from the 10-year chart, uh, it shows clearly that our students have had a strong performance over the years, uh, certainly for the first nine years in all areas. Uh, students have done extremely well. But the uh, 94, 95 scores dropped overall except for math. And um, I just wanted to make some comments about the 95 session. Um, this was the first year of the open-ended exam with written responses. Um, yet we do not believe that that was the reason that our students uh, didn't perform as well on this session of the exam. Um, if you look at the 10-year chart, you'll notice that our students' writing results over the years are extremely strong. Um, they're very strong writers in, in our uh, student body in general, uh, very strong verbal skills as a school, um, and our eighth grade students did very well on the, on the 95 uh, open-ended exam. Uh, what we do feel is that the unfortunate timing of the MEAs uh, played a role in our students' um, decreased in performance this year. Uh, you may remember last year was unusual for the fact that our uh, first session of the MEAs was delayed uh, by the Commissioner of Education because of a suicide poem. Uh, unfortunately, they were scheduled at a later time in our school. Uh, and I listed the school environment uh, at the time of the exam on the 10-year chart on the uh, top um, on the week of, of May 6. Uh, unfortunately, one of our students died and the funeral took place that week. Uh, it was the second student death last year. Um, and uh, the following week was a, a very difficult, very sad week in our school. Uh, some of our juniors had to take AP exams that week. And then the following week was the MEA exam. Uh, it took place on Monday through Thursday for four days. Uh, on Friday, our students had to take a, a makeup SAT exam because the uh, SAT exam was on the, on the day of the funeral. And our students were uh, very anxious about that. Um, overall, we, we felt like the timing was extremely unfortunate, um, that our students in, in general um, had a very flat affect at that time. Um, the tone of, of the school was uh, very quiet, very sad um, at that particular time. So we, we feel that our students really didn't do their best work at that time, that they, they were not able to um, as, a, as a, a general kind of condition. Um, and I just wanted to make those comments about, about the scores. Uh, we're testing again in two weeks, uh, on March 26th through the 29th. Um, and I think our students will, will be doing a better um, kind of test experience this year. Um, any questions in general about the MEAs? Um, Chair, it might be interesting to remind you that the 11th grade MEA is a test that is probably more of interest to how the school or school district in general is doing. It is not a test that affects individual students uh, in contrast at least to an SAT or an AP examination. Um, so that's a point that I think is uh, perhaps going to change because the state is, as I speak, looking at the learning results legislation and what kind of high school tests will be tied to that. In fact, um, those of you who've had a chance to look at some of that information know that they're talking about actually not giving the 11th grade MEAs next year using the funds that would normally go to that purpose to re-divert a study for an entirely different kind of assessment. They're talking about it's possibly being a certificate of mastery or some kind of initial core or some kind of e exit exam. I mean, I've seen all those terms used, and I don't think anybody has actually determined at this point what that would be. If all of that goes forward, that would be a very different kind of test from what we have seen uh, because it would be tied to the actual granting of a diploma. So 
one of the things we get into with tests is high stake, low stake tests. For, from the individual student point of view, the 11th grade MEA is a low stake test. If we go as a state from this to some kind of exit test, that will be very high stakes. So it will be interesting to see how those things go. Mm -hmm. That will be uh, year next year. No, actually, they're talking, oh, well, you know, it's sort of very much still in the talking stage. But if the legislation goes through as originally projected, uh, this year sixth graders will be the first grade to take some kind of exit test for diploma purposes. The interim between now and then is not clear what they would do, but there is uh, part of the proposal for the legislation that's being discussed right now is that there would be no 11th grade, not this year, but the following year, there would be no 11th grade test next year. We'll see if that happens. Right. Yes. More changes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, any questions? Yeah, are there questions from the board? We did have a chance to really discuss in depth a lot of these test scores, so there may not be, but we really appreciate you presenting them, Sharon. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, moving on in your packet. The I want to point out to actually, I should have pointed out as sort of um, communications, you had a message from Ponco principal's report, uh, he started that practice last month. In this particular case, he is summarizing some of the discussion to date about any possible changes in the schedule at Pond Cove next year. Um, Tom is here. If anybody has any questions or discussion they want to make at this time, we all know that that is an ongoing discussion. Okay or for information background. The next item on my report is plans for staff development day. Again, this was the year we uh, agreed in our contract to have two extra staff development days, one we had in January, and uh, this one originally scheduled for um, February 16th uh, has become a makeup day on March 30th, which is a Saturday because of the snow days. Uh, we rearranged our calendar. Uh, I did include for you um, the material that we've already sent out to the staff. And as a reminder, when we started this process with a sta central staff development committee, we actually surveyed the teachers and asked what were the two hottest topics in their, their uh, lexicon of needs that we wanted to cover this year. One was technology, the other was an opportunity to deal with system-wide uh, curriculum. So uh, what you'll see that day will be organized with four hours in the morning. Will be a block of time that teachers are even now, and we have most of the, we have a good percentage of the slips back, I think, don't we? Uh, signing up for the particular areas, and those are just for everybody's information. The arts, fine and performing. Foreign language, health and guidance, including physical education. Language arts, including reading. Mathematics, research science, social studies, technology, and special education. And in fact, um, what we're asking people to do, regardless uh, of what department they be, may be in, and some people teach two subjects. Obviously, elementary teachers usually teach the gamut, uh, or at least three subjects. Um, and that uh, make a choice, and we will try to make those groups as even as possible. We also, um, on the advice of the teachers who have been meeting to discuss what makes a staff development day work well, asked people to put down what questions you have you'd like to see addressed, and what questions you have you'd like to see addressed in one of the areas you would be unable to attend to try to get as much feedback from teachers as possible. There is an agenda for that day. Um, there's a faculty luncheon sponsored by the junior class. People are supposed to sign up. I thought this is terrific. We have some entrepreneurial juniors. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a discussion of this at, um, at an administrative meeting, and I think uh, hardly before I got upstairs, there was a young man in my office with this all nicely done on, on computer, and um, they're offering a menu. Um, I understand we will try to get the, the figures back as people sign up for these things so that they will be able to prepare. Uh, looks like a nice lunch. Any proceeds going to the junior class, right? Okay. Uh, we also uh, gave you a, uh, a sheet that we had prepared as facilitators. 
Um, the focus questions, ground rules for the discussion, and the fact that we're asking uh, recorders to prepare a brief one or two page summary of the day's discussions uh, and send it to Mary and we will try to do a compilation of that and when we do that obviously we will distribute to the school board as well as among all the staff curriculum I mean a workshop evaluation uh, and the last thing that uh, is in there in the packet are suggested ground rules questions comments thoughts I just comment that it's really been a wonderful process I think to put together workshop days this way and um, I hope it's one that continues. Well, I, sir, I strongly recommend that the idea of having a central committee that does reach out in a systematic way to t the staff to find out what are the issues that people are particularly concerned about use of time. Um, I think that a lot has been learned this year about how to organize these days. Um, in most cases, I think the work has been done by people within the system. We've had some assistance from without, but most of it is... Uh, is pretty much homegrown and, and really quite impressive with the quality of the work. So we'll let you know how it goes. You are welcome, but that is a day when Bon Cove and, um, <coughs> and middle school auction is going on. So I assume some of you will be very busy with that, but be, you'd be very welcome to come. Any questions? Moving on. The next item on... Um, and the last item on my list, uh, waiting for uh, Mr. Crosby to come. However, I'm going to keep my eye on the clock, and we'll just keep on going, yep. and when he shows up, we can do it. Uh, again, we uh, Thursday night this week, uh, Tom Eismeyer and I and a couple of uh, teachers, I know Jill Bell and I think one other, will be talking to the Pine Cove Parents Association about our science planning grant. It's called E equals MC squared. It's the three-town um, focus on K-8, but also involving some high school teachers uh, for an, an attempt to write a major planning grant. And our last real event of the year connected to that um, planning grant, before we actually sit down to start writing, is um, outlined for you on the sheet that's attached uh, to an agenda that I put in there. We have, we're really excited about what this uh, two-day affair will be. The teachers that we're targeting to send to these workshops are the teachers at the elementary who've been involved in the grant and a couple of others who we know are key people in, uh, in our math and science programs. We're also going to try to involve um, people at the high school level. And we certainly would like to inv invite school board members. And when we speak to the parents, we certainly would in include some parents in this, too. We'd very much like to do that. Here are the items. On one day, we'll be doing systems thinking and an overview of models of professional development. And the second day, which is uh, April 8th, we will be doing math and science teaching with a uh, really dynamite workshop leader. Um, actually a professor currently at Keene State College, but he's given a lot of math and science workshops and gets very high marks from the teachers um, who feel they get a lot out of it, and a workshop on technology that will be led by uh, Donna Muskella from the Technical Education Resource Center at Cambridge. I neglected to say that the systems thinking workshop will be led by John Shibley, who is a consultant, Portland Learning Organizations Group, and Doris Ray, who's a private educational consultant. I happen to have attended a number of workshops with Doris and one recently with both Doris and John on systems thinking. I was extremely impressed. So I think that one is really going to be right on target. The professional development, we're extremely fortunate to have Lynn Miller, director of the Southern Maine Partnership, and Margaret Arbuckle, a director of the Western Maine Partnership, uh, both people who are frankly right on top of what there is in professional development. So this is all the way through a wonderful opportunity. Uh, we are not targeting uh, to release half the school. It is a targeted presentation, and we will be um, releasing teachers for those two days. But we also want to involve the community, the board, and, um, and the high school. Questions? Sounds great. And we still have to write that grant. <laughs> it's going to be, however, fortunately, the deadline is September 1, so... And we, we have some plans on how we're going to do that. We'll let you know later. That's my stuff. Great. The next item on the agenda is school board subcommittees and reports. The first one is the finance committee. Charlie? Uh, we met at 6.30 in the town hall conference room. 
We had a very short meeting. We signed the warrants, reviewed the appropriations, any overages or, or um, negative balances, uh, reviewed the school lunch income statement, and we are essentially are on target. Uh, reviewed the central office personnel policy and possible changes. Reviewed a contract with SMRT and mechanical company for preventive maintenance. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks, Charlie. Next item is superintendent search committee. Ann? Well, we're moving along with the superintendent search. The application process has closed, and we have approximately 20 complete applications, um, which the school board is in the process of reviewing um, to try to get it down to 8 to, eight to 12 um, applications on Thursday night. Um, there was, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody in the community and the teachers and the staff who returned the questionnaires on superintendent qualifications. I know that was kind of an arduous task and a lot of people took the time to do that and it was appreciated. And a special thanks to Priscilla for tabulating all of those questionnaires. It was um, quite, quite a chore. Um, after those were completed, the school board had a, a workshop on superintendent qualifications on February 29th. I was out of town at the time, and I don't know if anybody wants to report about what happened um, at that meeting. Just, I'm, I'm happy to. Okay. If, do you want to keep going or should I report now? Oh, why don't you do that, and then I'll just um, We met. Um, there were probably 15, 15 to 20 people there. Um, Anne was absent and Charlie was absent, but there was a general consensus on coming up with what the major pieces or the priorities we were looking for. There was agreement that we really needed a very complex individual who could meet all of the suggested um, criteria in the um, questionnaire that was sent out, but we were able to prioritize and um, sort of articulate a little bit more what those meant to us and we are using those as we review the applications and as we go through the process um, but thank you all right um, I, I should I should stress that the meeting on Thursday night is to, for the school board only um, it is a confidential process for us to go through to screen it down to 8 to 12 after after that um, we will be setting up interviews hopefully for the last week in March um, uh, on that interview committee will be um, three board members, myself, Beth, uh, and Charlie. Um, we have two community members, Mark Foray, who's a former school board member, and Mike Roy, um, who's a community member who has also served on the building committee, and we're pleased to have them aboard. Um, we will have two teacher representatives. Right now, I only have the name of one, um, Gail Parker, who is a fifth grade teacher, and um, the three building administrators, Tom Eismeyer, uh, Nancy Hutton and Rick DeFusco. Have I forgotten anybody? I hope not. Okay. And then um, after that, we'll you know continue the process of, of winnowing, winnowing it down. But that's where we stand right now. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to call any of us. I think that's it. Thank you, Ann. Um, policy subcommittee is next. Back to you, Ann. Okay. Uh, we met last Thursday. Um, we discussed, uh, we had a presentation on a spring baseball trip to take place the last weekend in, in March um, for the high school varsity players. Um, we approved that trip. Um, and we had kind of a preliminary discussion about um, some possible funding from a local business um, of some uniforms or that that type of thing for um, for the baseball team we did not have enough information at that time to make a decision about that and and um, so we're still we're still looking for more information on that and the entire idea of having any outside funding of any of our sports programs so no I've heard um, you know comments in the community that we've had proposals in front of us and that we've turned them down that is not the case we actually have not had a formal presentation to us of any of those programs as yet um, we uh, discussed um, some issues with exchange students at the high school, and that will be an ongoing discussion, but I think Connie wanted to have something to say about that. Um, yes, this is something that is going to have to get explained to the community at large, people who do not even have students in school. 
Uh, we've had this year several requests from people who are residents of Cape who, for one reason or another, maybe a family connection or, uh, in some cases, students who are um, perhaps attending other schools, living abroad. And there has been a request to enroll a student uh, who would be kind of an informal family exchange. And uh, the expectation that the school is, a, uh, an, a, is ready to deal with that situation. Uh, rather than go into all the details right now, what I would like to just share is that um, in the course of trying to figure out what the best way of dealing with that is, a couple of things. We do have a policy on foreign exchange students. That policy does state that we will take them only if they start at, uh, at the beginning of the school year and can stay with us a full year and we are satisfied that the program is really a good uh, match for their needs. Uh, unfortunately, we, we find that people, for a variety of perfectly understandable reasons, uh, don't necessarily fit that full year issue and they've been asking us to look at some other arrangements. In the course of tracking this down, I have discovered that there are some very interesting issues at the immigration office because students sometimes, obviously, they're applying for a visa. And if you are in an exchange program that is a, uh, what we might call a more traditional program, like the American Field Service, um, a program, as I understand it, that does, in fact, charge the student or the student's family a fee, they handle a lot of the legwork and the placement and so forth. Uh, but in the last uh, so many years, there's been an increase in students asking for another type of visa that requires a different set of forms and is much more informal. However, when you track it down to the school, we have the obligation to sign an I-20 form. I'm not sure if there's another one for the other thing. These are things that I need to get all nailed down for you. But um, we, as a school system, sign a form that assures uh, the immigration service that the student is either la English language proficient, enrolled in a full academic program, uh, and that the program is absolutely meets that student's needs. And furthermore, if we do sign it and the student is not fully English proficient, that we as a school system take on the obligation to provide an ESL program. Uh, the implications of that are quickly pretty broad for the um, a school system this size. We don't have enough foreign uh, language students for us to have a certified ESL teacher. When we have occasional students, that becomes a problem for us, and we have been trying to solve that problem. So right off, there's a big red flag out there that says we need to clarify this procedure, and we will be asking um, Cape residents, when we will be putting out some information probably through the courier, to explain all of this, that if, they, if a call goes to the high school, the high school administration is somewhat dubious about whether we can be accommodating in this situation is not because we are not interested in having foreign exchange students. They obviously are a wonderful resource for us, but we want to make sure that their program is, uh, is an appropriate one, and furthermore, we are taking on some obligations to assure that, and some of those obligations would exceed our normal ability to deal with that. Uh, since some of the calls we've been getting are from people who do not have students in the school, in some cases are not even it, are going to be having the student in their homes, but are arranging this um, for the student to come and live with other people, we feel it is necessary to get this information out to people so they understand that there is a limitation and that there are some real safeguards that go uh, with this. And I am arranging a meeting for the policy subcommittee with our um, with Dottie Michaud, who works at the Immigration Department, who has given me quite a lot of background information. So we will eventually have a policy on that. But just in case there's anybody contemplating these things, please understand that we do have some real serious obligations that we take on. And, and we want to be uh, both uh, welcoming and accommodating, but we also have to make sure we're doing it right. Thank you. And lastly, um, the, uh, the special ed program here was audited by the state, a routine last audit um, last week, and as a result of that, uh, we were asked to change some language in a policy that we have for our first reading here tonight. We'll come up later. Thank you, Ann. Uh, the next item is unfinished business policy second readings. Could we like change the order of these things? I know. No. Sorry. Okay. Um, we have several policies for second reading tonight. 
uh, filed JICI weapons in the schools, JIHA student lockers storage facilities, IL student assessment, and GCFB recruiting and hiring of administrative staff and GCFBR procedure for recruiting and hiring of administrative staff. Does anybody have any questions on any of these comments? Anybody in the audience? Rick? Rick, if I could just ask you, did you ever get any feedback? None of us, I, I don't think, heard from any students about the, the locker policy or the, you, you didn't have any feedback? Okay. Okay. Is there a motion? I have to move on my own. Yeah. I don't know. Is there a motion? Okay. Carla's going to Carla, motion. thank you. I move that the, um, Policies, JICI weapons in the schools, JIHA student locker storage facilities, IL student assessment, GCFB recruiting and hiring of administrative staff, and GCFB-R procedure for recruiting and hiring administrative staff um, be accepted into policy as written. Second. second. Charlie, any discussion? All those in favor? Seven zero. Thank you, Anne. It's a lot of work. Uh, Full committee. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is new business. And the first item is the high school proposal to increase the number of credits for graduation. And Rick, I'd love to have you take over. <laughs> I have one other announcement to make. Uh, thir this third evening, we'll be hosting the uh, eighth grade parents to the high school talk about curriculum and scheduling for next year. They received, we mailed out um, the uh, study guides to grades 8 through 11. So in that study guide, we included uh, an invitation to Thursday night. So that also for the uh, viewing audience, that will be happening this Thursday at 7 o'clock at the high school. Uh, what I'd like to do now, uh, you've, uh, as the board and Dr. Goldman have received um, previously some information concerning a request or a recommendation from the high school administration and staff well, we've been reviewing for the past year and a half and, and have come up with the recommendation to increase graduation requirement, requirements from 210 credits to 230. In terms of, um, in comparison to other schools, that would be similar to going from 21 Carnegie units to 23 or the addition of two, two more classes over the course of four years. In this proposal, we are also asking or um, attempting to balance uh, when students take courses so that students will be asked to take six courses a year as at a minimum within two years for all classes. Next year, the, um, the freshmen, I mean the seniors, will be required to take a minimum of five. I also want to address the issue that, that Dr. Goldman presented that though the uh, learning results, which will affect the class of 2002, which my son is a member of, um, they, it is a test on competencies in eight areas, but in talking with, with Senator Amro about that, who's on the, one of the chairs of the committee and proponents of it, it will not over, uh, in, overstep what the local uh, requirements are. So they, they may have changes in the competencies. It still allows each local system to have their own criteria for graduation, though there is a competency level that they would uh, have to meet. So I wanted to make clear that we've, we've discussed that issue. Would this impede any sort of attempt in, in a three or four years to, to keep this process going? What I'd like to do is hopefully go to the overhead here for our viewing audience again. Uh, What I'd like to do is slide this down. First of all, a bit of a historical perspective, that before 19, uh, in 1981, the high school required 17 Carnegie units, or 170 credits, for graduation. And that was based on a seven period day. And students at that time were required to take five out of seven classes. And out of a possible 28 classes over four years, as it states here, 17 
requirements were needed in order to graduate. So 11 courses or 11 free periods over the course of the four years uh, were available to students. In that, that not, did not necessarily mean that they did not take other courses, but were not required to do that. In 1982, graduation requirements increased to 21 Carnegie units, or what our present 210 credits are. It was still a seven period day, and out of the possible 28 class periods over four years, 21 requirements were needed in order to graduate, which left again seven potential free periods for students. Requirements at that time were added in fine arts, technology, and human development, which since has changed to our health, uh, our health requirements. So those requirements were also added at that time. And you can see since 1981, there had been no changes to that. In 1989, we made a change to our eight period schedule, but no change in graduation requirements. And again, out of a possible 32 periods, uh, class periods over four years, 21 requirements are needed in order to graduate, which again goes back to 19, before 1980 or 81, where 11 free periods are possibly out there for, for students not to take advantage of. And I think with the number of courses we're offering students, we wish to have them take advantage of, of the uh, courses that are there. I did a, a bit of a, of a review over the past six years, and you can see that over the course since 1990, between seven, uh, 67 or 69 and 70 percent of the students have already taken our uh, graduate credits and more. So we're looking to raise our expectations for everyone in the high school so that all, all graduates will, will graduate with. Uh, again, 230 credits as a minimum. Uh, and all of these numbers included students with IEPs, and we will take that in consideration that if, that, if, that if it's written in an IEP that there's certain requirements that a student cannot meet due to that IEP request, then we can honor that. But prior to that, all, all students regardless of IEPs not were in, involved in that. What would the high school look like for students in four years? Again, starting in the fall of 1996, all freshmen will schedule six courses. Band would be a seventh if they so choose. All sophomores and juniors will schedule six and no more than seven courses per semester. And all seniors will schedule again for the fall of 96, a minimum of five courses. And that is due primarily to their requirement is not changing. Beginning in the fall of 1997, all students, seniors included, will schedule a minimum of six courses per semester. As far as course requirement changes, uh, beginning in the fall of 96, a required one semester social studies course for all freshmen and a required one semester social studies course for all seniors. And I'd, I've asked Mr. Cooper to join me tonight if there are any questions concerning that, that curriculum shift. And all it is, it's not an addition, it's just a shift from a, from a one year course to freshman year to a one semester course and then moving a semester into the senior year. So it's still a three year requirement of, of social studies. And we will keep the Holocaust, will be, be an elective course for freshmen and sophomores, and that was a concern that we would lose that opportunity for students to take that course, and it will be an elective. The way graduation requirements will be prior to 1999, all students beginning with the class of 1999 will need to earn 230 credits, the class of 1998, 220, and the class of 1997 will remain at 210. And what I also wanted to show you, which you did not have on your I, I wanted to show you comparisons to other school districts and school systems in the greater Portland area. If we're looking at Cape Elizabeth, which currently has 210 credits, again, 21 Carnegie units, we're proposing 230. We currently have an eight class periods, five required. We're looking to go to eight, six required courses. That's up in the, in the top. Chevres has 24 and a half credits needed for graduation. Part of that is a religious credit. Uh, they, I think five credits are for religion. They have a seven class period day. And students are required to take six courses at Shepherds. At Macaulay, again, a 23 credit or 230 credits, similar to what we're looking at. They have a seven class periods per day. Six are required. When we get down to Kennebunk, they currently have 21. They're going to 22. They have block scheduling, where there are four, four periods per day. Students are required to take three out of four. OK, so over a year, they will have six out of eight. Uh, Falmouth, 21 credits for graduation, or again, what, currently what we would have. They have an eight class period day, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Students are not allowed to take more than 10 studies per week. They have four classes on Tuesday and Thursday, which are 80 minute periods. If you can understand that, that's great, because I didn't. But anyway, 21 credits for Falmouth. Yarmouth, 20 credits, seven class periods, five required courses. Freshmen may only take six. What they're saying is that upper class may take six or seven, but freshmen may only take six at Yarmouth out of seven. 
Portland, uh, seven class periods, five required, again, 19 and a half credits. Deering is 19 and a half. And, and they're in block scheduling. I, I should, should clarify, they have eight class periods, but they go four one semester and four another, or so that students take three out of four in that, in that time frame. Scarborough, 19 credits to graduate, eight class periods, five per day. So they would, it's similar to Ottawa, where we meet six times a day. Three of their courses are on a rotating schedule, and they have five required courses. Gorham, five class periods, I mean seven class periods, five required courses. Losing this here. Greeley, eight class periods, 18 credits, six per day. Up. Their, their schedule is similar to ours, and they require five courses with only 18 requirements. South Portland, seven class periods, five required courses. So it gives you a kind of an idea of what other school systems in the greater Portland area are, requ are requiring of their, of their graduates. And uh, again, we've spent a great deal of time on this with the faculty, and, and I, I have the total support of the faculty. Uh, to pursue, uh, pursue this recommendation. And I'm coming to the board tonight to, to explain this. Again, you've had the packet with some of the other information, but I thought it would be great to compare with other schools, and not necessarily Greater Portland, but even down in York County with, with Kenny Bunk uh, High School, which they're looking at for, for courses. Rick, I just want to thank you for all this hard work. You really have looked into this and talked to your faculty about it, and it's a, it's a wonderful proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I missed something on the social studies there. The required one semester for freshmen, required one semester for seniors. Where's the third semester? Did, didn't you say there were three? Sophomores and juniors have required courses, okay. one year. Okay. See, it used to be that you had a one-year freshman course, one-year sophomore, one-year junior, one of them being U.S. history in the junior year. What we're doing is, because of the Lighthouse program in the freshman year, mm -hmm. we're shifting, and also, the recommendation from social studies that they would they really have been wanting to have a senior course offered so we took part of that freshman uh, not to overload freshmen and say you have a one semester which we're calling introduction to social studies and then the, the history course mr cooper would you, you want to uh, Senior course will be a, a level course also. So it'll be a senior course and an I want to commend you too, Rick, um, on the process you've followed to do this. It's been very, very thorough, and you've worked hard to, you know, gain consensus and have it be, really be uh, a rational, defensible plan. And um, I think, I think the beauty of it is um, that it 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 goes a long way towards reclaiming senior year as a real academic year, which I think is something we were concerned about. Um, before that um, senior year seemed to be a time when when uh, students were feeling they could t take fewer courses this goes back to the idea that it's a four-year high school and that there's there's something very uh, legitimate for you to do and um, challenging to do all four years and I think it also will um, help address the problem of kids front-loading 
their courses and, you know, we hear constant complaints about the kids are very stressed. And this, will, I think, will help um, students pace themselves um, more appropriately. And we do have so much to offer. It gives kids that m many more chances to take what you have to and offer. Again, it's again, great. The balancing of four years. So yep. that, so students do get a, a full uh, core courses for yep. the four years of high school. And that's not to say that those students who, who seek early graduation, that opportunity will still be there. And it's still possible, even with the uh, increased requirements. Right. Are there other comments or questions? Charlie? I, th I think the most commendable thing is the process, as I agree with Anne, that you went about to arrive at this decision and this, and this proposal. The fact that you looked at what we were doing, the number of courses and credits that students or the majority of them were taking, and essentially just redesigning and requiring all students to, to do the same requirement without really impacting the budget. And I think that's commendable. Any other questions or comments? We need a motion on this, Connie? I think it would be in order. Oh, public, sorry. Yes, if you'd like to, come on up. Come to the podium and state your name, and thank you. Good evening, my name is Lisa Kittredge, and before I say what I need to say, uh, I first have to say that Mr. DeFusco, I've spoken to him about this. He has, he, I know he's putting in a Herculean effort. Um, in terms of the social studies department, my son has had three years with them. He has loved every course. They've, you know, he's come home each year and said, boy, this is the best one I've ever had. Um, my son is a junior. He'll be a senior next year. Um, what my concern is this, is that he was going to take another social studies course in any event next year. James took eight courses his first year, and I think he took eight last year, and he's taking seven and a half this year, and he was going to take a full load next year. Um, but I have some concerns about the fact that he will be required to take a social studies class next year, even though he's already completed his requirements, but there is no math class available for him. And that's my concern. It's not that he's taking the social studies class. Because I, as I said, he would take it anyway. He likes the teachers. He likes the subject matter. He likes to be busy in school. But there's no math. And he's not the only one. There's a small number of them. But it troubles me to hear that, well, it's pretty hard to justify a math class when there's only a handful of kids in this position. Well, I think math is important. Um, and I guess that's all I have to say. I would really like to see a math class for those kids. Um, James has one year. I know there are students, uh, there's a soft, sophomore in James' calculus class this year who has two years ahead of him. Um, thank you. Can I ask you two quick questions? Sure. So you don't have any issue with the number of the, the credit requirements? Oh, no. I think, is I think it's fine. What my issue is is that I see if you're going to be requiring seniors to take a class over and above now the three credits, that does have to cost something, doesn't it? Isn't that, I mean, I, it would seem to me that, you know, there's, there's a class that they weren't required to take. Well, it's only the other half. They've divided that year between. But, but they've already taken it. I understand this, that. But uh, the, the three-year requirement, right. one semester freshman year, right. one semester senior year, it, they haven't increased that requirement. No, except that my son has already done no. three credits. Well, I understand that. So theoretically, though, anyone that's already finished three credits of social studies might not take more. But there will be more there should be more students taking social studies, and that's fine. That's wonderful. I have no problem with that, I think. And that's why I wanted to say what I wanted to say up front, mm -hmm. is that that's not my concern. It's just that, you know, we're looking at increasing graduation requirements, and that's great, too. Uh, but we don't have a math class. Mm -hmm. That's my concern. Does that, yeah. that yeah. clarify? It's certainly a concern of the board, and I'm sure we will ask Rick to hear more about that later. And That's uh, my concern. Yep. 
Hi, my name is Helene Hornby. I have a son who's a junior. Um, I want to build on what Ms. Chapman said and also Ms. Kittredge, Ms. Chapman's remark about reclaiming senior year as an academic year and Ms. Kittredge's concerns about the math program. Um, I want to really raise two issues. One is your policy and second is broken promises. The policy relates to students who are accelerated in math. I have the same concern as Mrs. Kittredge. You have a very laudable policy of allowing students to advance in the math program uh, consistent with their ability. And what that means is that some students, as early as sixth grade, take high school level algebra. They take geometry in seventh grade. They take advanced algebra in eighth grade. By the time they get to the high school, ninth grade, there's two courses left, which is FST and 10th grade calculus. Um, the problem is not only that there's nothing to offer these students past the 10th grade, but that the high school doesn't even acknowledge academic credit for the courses that were taken in the earlier years before the ninth grade. So in effect, their records only show two years of high school credit in math, um, namely for FST and calculus, and no credit for earlier. Um, when they're going to apply for colleges, as you know, the better colleges do look at are hoping for four years of high school math programs, and they only have two years. Uh, which leads me to my second issue, which is broken promises. When we raised this issue last year, in the sophomore year to the administration, we were told that there would be a math program available in the junior year for the children who are in this circumstance, which is a handful of, of students. Over the summer, we got the, um, the curriculum the final curriculum, and there was indeed no math program available. We had to scramble to fill up uh, the schedule with another elective, and finally a, a teacher came forward and volunteered to uh, do an independent study in the second semester where we ordered the materials and paid for half of them ourselves, which we were glad to do. Um, but we were promised that there would be a math program the following year, namely next year, because there'd be enough students in the two classes to warrant a program. Uh, when we just got the new schedule out a few weeks ago, a week or two ago, there was indeed no math program for next year. So that's what we call broken promises. We're very frustrated about this. We have, um, we'd like you to come up with a solution that has three, three criteria involved. One is that it's actually a formal course, not an independent study. Two is that there's a live teacher. And three is that it's given on campus. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Hi, I'm Zach Hornby. I'm a junior. That's my mom. <laughs> I'm one of the students that this affects. And I did take these classes, 6th, 7th, 8th grade. I took these uh, high school courses. And now I get, you know, I get the Cape Elizabeth study guide in the mail last week. It says I need three high school credits just to graduate in math. And of course, I'm not going to have three. I only have two with the current system. Not only that, my guidance counselor, Ms. Merrill, has recommended to me that I will need four formal years of math in order to get into the colleges that I would like to get into. And as my mom said, I was assured at the beginning of this year that I would have a, at the beginning of this academic year, that I would have a class for next year, my senior year. But when I got the schedule, there, was, there were no options for me because I've exhausted all the courses that are offered by the high school. And as my mom said, I would like, we would like to have a formal class. We've heard uh, recommendations that we can take an independent study or we can go to USM. But frankly, that doesn't cut it for a busy high school student. First of all, with the rotating schedule, we can't take a class at USM during the day because every day we have a different period at a different time. In the afternoon, you know, everyone, seems, everyone in the high school seems to be involved with at least varsity sport, you know, the cultural exchange club, the Spanish club, the prom committee, and there's just no time to drive half an hour into Portland, take a two-hour class, drive half an hour back. There literally is not three hours to do that. And I feel that it's the school's obligation, the same school who accelerated me in sixth grade, as well as there's seven other students in my situation, I feel it's the school's obligation to provide us these courses that we need for our graduation. 
as well as to get into the colleges that we want to further our education. And uh, again, I've, I've heard mention of you know getting interactive TV or uh, again the independent studies, but really the independent studies it's hard when, you, when you've used up the whole University of Chicago system math books, it's very hard to do an independent study on your own in math. It's, I, don't, I don't really know how to go about studying math with no guidance, so it's, I think it's really important that we have a class that we can go to every day, have a teacher there to instruct us. Thank you. Rick, did you want to respond? There's no question that, that we do have a dilemma here. In fact, it's something that um, affects Zach and, and, in fact, also the, the current sophomore class, too, who will be juniors next year. We think we've remedied that beyond that in that pre-calculus, which was not a requirement in the sequence of math courses, will be part of the four-year sequence so that if a student completes up to geometry in the middle school, they would come to the high school, take honors advanced algebra, then go into FST, take pre-calculus and calculus. Before this, this year, and in, case, in Zach's case, pre-cal was not a required course. Students could jump from FST or uh, functions and statistics, can go right into calculus. And the Chicago series has come up with a pre-cal program that we have found to be very valuable and, and important to our kids. Um, so that will remedy it two years down the line. But we do have a situation now where students like Zach and about six others who are Literally, we, we do not have a course beyond calculus to offer them. We've tried to do independent studies. I've also talked with the University of Southern Maine and the Southern Maine Partnership about an early studies program. They have talked about actually coming to the schools because we're not the only school in this situation. Scarborough's faced with this and a few others. And I've had discussions with Sue Jenrin, who's the assistant superintendent there, and I know uh, Dr. Goldman has also. So it's something that, that is not only faced with Cape Elizabeth, but also uh, faced with other schools in the, uh, in the general Portland area, and we're trying to, to do that. I don't have an answer for, for, uh, for the students for next year other than you know pursuing courses beyond the high school uh, the doors of the high school, uh, whether we can offer a course beyond calculus. I'll be honest with you, too, that the expertise of, of, of a math teacher to be able to create a course for next fall um, also takes time and consideration also. So uh, it is a dilemma, and I think we need to, we need to, uh, to discuss that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yep. and we, again, we've talked today on the phone, and there are some options out there, um, but I think uh, I think Zach's point is well taken, the idea that as a junior or senior not to be able to, to have to try to transport elsewhere with our rotating schedule, among other things, it makes it very difficult. It's, it's uh, something we really need to look at very quickly. Thank you, Rick. I'm sure we will be looking at it. Can I, can I just clarify something about the policy, the, the policy you, you spoke to um, about the high school credits? That was a policy we did just institute. A, couple months ago. Um, I just want to clarify that courses that were taken at the high school while a student was at the um, middle school can be listed on the transcript. They're not included in calculating the credits for high school graduation, but they certainly can be listed on the transcript as well as any other accelerated um, courses a student takes during the summer or any other time. So. You probably already knew that, but just to clarify to anybody listening. I, I still won't have the credits needed to graduate from our high school. I only have two years of formal math plus. One teacher voluntarily has given, has given me a half a year of study, but that still leaves me you know, a semester short. So despite what you just said, I still will not be able to graduate with this. I, I know that doesn't take care of that. I just want to take care of the the recognition on, on the transcript. But. Other questions, comments? We need a motion on the uh, increased requirements. Gail. Um, I move that we accept uh, Mr. DeFusco's proposal to increase the graduation requirements to 230 credits by the year um, beginning, with the beginning with the class, 1999? Mm -hmm. 1999. Is there a second? Priscilla? A second. Any more discussion? 
Carla? I just want to clarify um, for myself that um, any vote on this does not preclude discussion on the math issue. In, Absolutely not. Right. They're actually not connected. Right. Because the social studies was kind of connected, but I just wanted to clarify that that does not necessarily mean that the math issue no. is connected. Okay. And the other thing is that the, the requirement for a pre-calculus course will hopefully retard this kind of a problem in the future. But again, and any time you do a transition for requirements, it always seems to impact a particular class or a few students. I hope that we will be able to work out the graduation requirements for those who have outstripped our math program for those six students. Yeah, I think it's important to say that we do, we are discussing the math issue and we discussed it last year during the budget process and um, to an extent it seems like um, both in the math area and also it, it may become true in foreign language, we're a little bit a victim of our own success and, and it, it, it really is, it's painful um, to see very, you know, bright, able students seemingly punished by the system. Um, just want to make it clear that's no one's intent and we're trying, you know, we are trying to work that through. All those in favor? Seven zero. Honey, did you want to go back to the senior? Uh, oh, yes. I think Skip Crosby just joined us. Skip, we Skip, we left the um, high school student service project for your arrival. Thank you for fitting us in. Let me start by, <clears throat> I'm Skip Crosby, I'm the uh, Spanish teacher at the high school and also the advisor to the student service uh, project. Let me thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to explain what we've done since October um, and also for giving me, allowing me the privilege of being a part of this, what I consider a very exciting program. Um, since October, I've worked with Mrs. Schmader, Mrs. Gail Schmader, and Marilyn Mahalik to place students in volunteer opportunities. Mrs. Mahalik has been instrumental in calling various agencies to develop placements for students, and Mrs. Schmader has worked very closely with me to coordinate uh, student placements at the middle school and the Pond Cove School. In October, I initiated the program with a general announcement to the school inviting any student interested in volunteering to attend an informal informational meeting. Just under 40 students attended that meeting. During that time, I had them list their name and their area of interest with the hope that I would be able to um, seek out placements that correlated with their interests. Soon afterwards, Jessica Freeman and Amy Kirstein created a bulletin board in a very visible place at the high school in which I post all of the opportunities that are, that are currently available. Mrs. Schmader developed a volunteer log form on which students keep a record of all the uh, services that they're involved in. A form, that form is attached to the papers I gave to you. The form will be turned in to me at the end of each semester. I will keep each log on file and make them available to the students at the end of their four years so that when, they when, when time comes to uh, fill out their transcripts and resumes. So far, we've been very successful at matching students to the openings in a very timely manner. Um, positions have been long-term, short-term, and one-time only type. One problem has been, and I guess if you have to have a problem, it's not a bad one to have. But one problem has been to find enough placements 
um, to meet all the interest that we currently have. Um, a week doesn't go by without three or four students walking into my room wanting something to do, and they usually share their interests at that time as well. Another challenge, given that the intent of this program is to include the whole student body, has been to <coughs> effectively communicate in terms of advertising available listings and getting and dis excuse me and disseminating necessary information. We do have a core of seven to ten students that serve as student leaders of SSP and meet regularly with Mrs. Schmader and Mrs. Mihalik and with me to help plan activities. Currently, we're planning a youth service day on April 27th. Our vision is to involve the school community and the and the community of Cape Elizabeth for a morning of community service in which we are planning to help senior citizens in need uh, around their homes. We will invite all students, local officials, and principals to, um, to help w with us. We will provide bagels in the morning, and everyone will meet back after the time uh, of working. It'll be, I think, eight to, we said nine to one or something. I'm not exactly sure of the time. Um, to make their own subs. Overall, I think we're off to a very successful, exciting beginning. We're in the, we're in the process of, of defining ourselves and clarifying our mission. Different issues continually emerge that need to be addressed, but I believe that by next year, we will have a good foundation upon which we can strengthen and improve our program. Comments, constructive criticism, and input from the board, community, and students are more than welcomed. It's my strong desire to engage as many students as possible in volunteerism, with the hope that we will be creating a citizenry, citizenry that makes its volunteerism a part of its daily life. And I don't know if there are any, but I would be happy to address any questions that anyone might have. Um, yeah, since this is a slightly different format than the way it's been in the past, where students actually took, a, it was a week or two weeks off from school, um, how does this fit, is this um, during school, after school? I, mean, I see some of them are like upon COVID, whatever would be during school, but what sort of scheduling is involved here? The scheduling is according to the need of whoever needs a volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, for example, the Pond Cove placements <clears throat> are done during study halls and free time, and uh, the student just checks out, goes up, and then checks back in. And things like, uh, say, the soup kitchen, that could be during the school day or not? Those are usually <coughs> after school. The, the, well, the breakfast, obviously. <laughs> the YES program participated in the uh, breakfast, and that was during school. Mm -hmm. But my understanding is that most of the soup kitchen work is after school hours. Uh, with the, the SAC student government is currently doing soup mm -hmm. kitchen. Mm -hmm. I think that's after school hours. But yes, yes activities are usually during, the, you know, the United Way sponsor program is right. usually during the school day. And Mrs. Schmader has been escorting them in the van. Okay. Other questions from board members? I, I just think this, uh, the Youth Service Day is a great idea. I think it's a good way to make that match between students and um, uh, older people in the community who might not get a chance to interact um, with kids. I think it's a great idea. Great. Thanks. I just want to commend you, Skip, on Thanks. getting it all off the ground and getting it started and having this presentation by March. Charlie? Exciting. How would you plan to advertise the Youth Service Day so that the senior citizens in our community or anyone who has a need well, what, I, what we did, I, I've contacted uh, Barbara Ray and, and I've been working with the town manager's office to try to get names. And I've also asked students to um, give, me, give me suggestions of if, you know, if they know of anybody that might need uh, assistance to, um, re to tell me about them and that I would make the contacts. Is that the communication you meant? Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions? As low as low key as possible was our was our desire. I'm just glad to see this off the ground, and I'm glad it's working well. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh,
Going back to new business, the next item on the agenda is nominations for athletic coaching positions for 95-96. Okay. Connie? And in your packet, you have a list. Um, eighth grade baseball, Gerald McQueenie. Um, eighth grade softball, Neen Stanford. Seventh grade softball, Paige Brown. Uh, seventh and eighth grade track, Paul Casey. Seventh and eighth grade track, Therese Roberts. Seventh and eighth grade tennis, Steve Price. Seventh and eighth grade lacrosse, Charlie Carroll. Um, assistant to the, there must be, these are assistant to the tracks, track teams uh, at the high school, Jim Littrow Capes. Assistant track part time, Bill Rice. Assistant baseball, Todd Day. And JB baseball, Doug Jones. And you also have some information on those who are new to the coaching roster. I believe Jim Littrow Capes is assistant tennis. Oh, assistant tennis. Okay, I'm sorry. That wasn't clear on mine. Are there questions? Actually, yes. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, and I don't know if, if Rick knows this, on the assistant tennis and on the assistant track, are they to be assistants to both the boys and girls teams? Do you know? Uh-huh. And then, and then I know in tennis that, that they're, the two assistants help with both, and Andy oversees both teams. Okay. With track, I believe it's the same. What Keith has done is tried to get three, three coaches under, uh, under the heading of, of two teams okay. with, with assistants in both areas. Ann? Okay. Um, my question is actually for Nancy. About if, are we getting close, do you know, to getting a seventh grade baseball coach seeing as the season is? Don't know. I, I, I just want to make a general comment that I think we should be advertising before we do, <laughs> well in advance because, um, you know, I know a lot of people make plans or are looking for new opportunities way ahead of the scheduled season, and we seem to um, often be um, pretty late in doing this. That's just a general editorial comment. <laughs> Are there any other comments or questions? Is there a motion, Charlie? I move acceptance of the superintendent's um, listing of middle school and high school coaching positions for second. the 96 season. Is there a second? I second. <clears throat> Gail, any more discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. And then retirements, Connie? We have two retirements in your packet. First one, Margaret Young, uh, who actually, when we normally with our food service, we don't necessarily bring the people coming and going because it's not, it, since it's not a contract position, doesn't require board vote. But Margaret has been with us a long time, and I wanted to make sure that you understood that she was, in fact, retiring and take this opportunity to thank her for serving 22 years mm -hmm. in our food service program. And I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to congratulate her later, but I wanted to bring that to your attention. And you also have one teacher retirement from Rolly Moore, who has also been in the system for uh, close to 20 years. I'm not sure that it is a full 20 at this point. I don't think I think it's over 20. Is it over 20? It's over 20, I know. Do you know Mary exactly? 26. I think it's 25 because I think that he was uh, counting on the fact that he needed 25 years for the retirement system, and that's the only place he's ever taught. Okay, all right, then then I stand very much corrected. Well, I can tell you, he started in 1970, so, so it's that 25 years. It is. That is. <laughs> anyway, he is a uh, certainly a Cape institution and. We will also have an opportunity to um, speak to him, and I'm sure the teacher retirement dinner. Uh, those many of you do attend that. So those are our two retirements. Is there a motion? Do we do we have to do we include? You do um, accept the teachers. Uh, you can right. do both. Uh, I think that would be appropriate. We don't normally do the food service, but why don't you? And I move that we accept the uh, retirements of Rolly Moore and Margaret Young. Is there a second? Second. Priscilla? I second that. Any discussion? Comments? Just want to thank them for their years of service. Um, all those in favor? <laughs> Seven zero. 
And then last thing under new business is the policy of first reading notice of authorization. And actually, I should have added, you have another one coming from the same pipeline. That is the site review. There will probably be, I understand from talking to Wayne, others. Uh, part of the site review is to look at updated state forms and to make sure that our written policies um, have the whatever the required language may be. So these probably aren't the only two that you will be seeing. Uh, and you see in bold language on file IGBAC, referral to the pupil evaluation team. The only addition is what is the one sentence referrals initiate, initiated upon receipt of the referral by the special education team leader. Uh, may not seem like a particularly vital change to you, but when we're dealing with these regulations, we do in fact have to follow them to the letter, including our written policies. And also the same thing with the notice of authorization. What is different is what is in bold print. I, I just want to, um, when, when we had our policy meeting, we only talked about this notice of authorization. Right. Not this, but the way it looks to me is that these two things are actually part of the same thing. I mean, they, um, I'm not sure about the number. I think that uh, IGBAC-E2, it does look like that, right? That's true. So if that's, I think we need clarification from Wayne about whether this is supposed to be one document. Well, we can do it this way from the numbers. IGBAC is clearly the parent right. policy. The IGBAC-E2, uh, it's like an, uh, it's, it's kind of like an administrative guideline, right? right? Well, and if you read the language as it is here, this, the notice of authorization replaces IGBAC-E2, that is what we have now, is labeled as IGBAC-E2. The uh, referral to pupil evaluation team, it says, replaces IGBAC-E1. Again, those were the way we had them in our policies, they were administrative explanations, part of a, another packet. They want us very clearly, uh, and I did check, I did have this conversation with Wayne, to list them as they're listed here, IGBAC. Okay. The notice of authorization probably does go with it. It does not have a separate letter. I can double check on that one, but the pertinent point is the updating of the language. Right. Okay. Well, just so we know whether we're talking about two parts of one okay. policy or whether this should have a file number on it. Okay, we'll check on that. Okay. And I, I think you will be seeing others of this type of thing. Are there any other comments for Ann on that policy as it goes back? No? Then I would ask that we um, take a recess now. We're going to have a budget workshop, and then we will come back in session for just about one minute and do a vote to go into um, executive session. So we will recess. Thank you.